In this video, we will look at an example of linear programming, model formulation, and graphical solution. Linear programming, which is also sometimes called linear optimization, is a really useful tool in business analytics. It's called linear programming because we have a model that contains a lot of lines, but it turns out that a lot of things can be modeled with lines. So this is a really useful method. It helps us achieve an optimal outcome, which is either a maximum or a minimum. So we want to maximize things like profit, and we want to minimize things like cost. There are three steps to set up a linear programming model. We're gonna define the decision variables. Those are usually the things that we're trying to produce. We're going to define our objective function. That's the thing that we want to maximize or minimize, such as minimum cost. And then we want to define our constraints. And these are usually related to the resources that we have, things that are going to limit our production. Then once we've set up this model, there are steps to solve the model. We're going to plot the model constraints. These are going to be lines. We're going to consider our inequalities and shade the feasible region, the region where things could happen. Then we're going to plot the objective function. We're going to move the line out from the origin to find a maximum or move it closer to the origin to find a minimum. And then we're going to solve simultaneous equations to find the solution point. We'll do an example so you can see what I'm talking about. For this example, we're going to look at question number 38 on page 67. This is chapter two. It's a problem about the Valley Wine Company. And I'll pause here and let you read the question. So part A says, formulate a linear programming model for this problem. Those are the first three steps. And then part B says that we're going to solve the model. So those are steps four through six. So for step one, we define our decision variables. So this wine company makes two kinds of wine. I'm going to let X1 equal the number of batches to make a valley nectar. I picked that one as the first one because it's listed first in the book. And I let X2 be the number of batches I need to make a valley red. They're producing things in thousand gallon batches. So we're going to just count the number of batches, not the number of gallons. Step two is to define the objective function. So what are we trying to do? If we read the very last sentence, before part A, it says the company wants to determine the number of batches to produce in order to maximize profit. So we want to maximize profit. That's our objective. We're going to use, we were talking about thousands of gallons of wine. We're going to talk about thousands of dollars. The profit for a batch of nectar is $9,000. Profit for a batch of red is $12,000. So our total profit is going to be nine times the number of batches of the nectar plus 12 times the number of batches of the red. So our profit function looks like this, and this is what we want to maximize. Step three, we define the constraints. So what kinds of limits do we have? Well, we just, we read through the problem. There is a limit to the number of grapes they have. They have 64 tons of grapes. Each batch of nectar requires four tons of grapes. Each batch of red requires eight tons of grapes. So when we add those together, it has to be less than or equal to 64. That's in tons of grapes. The next thing mentioned in the problem is that production is limited by availability of storage space. They have 50 cubic yards for storage space and each batch requires five cubic yards. 
So five times the number of batches of nectar plus five times the number of batches of red has to be less than or equal to 50. That's in cubic yards. The next sentence says, the processing time for a batch of nectar is 15 hours. The processing time for a batch of red is eight hours. And a little bit earlier in the problem, it tells us that production is limited to that 50 cubic yards of storage space, but also to 120 hours of processing time. So we know that 15 times the number of batches of nectar plus eight times the number of batches of red has to be less than or equal to 120. The next sentence says demand for each type of wine is limited to seven batches. So each of those batches has to be less than or equal to seven. And we can't have negative numbers. These are number of batches. So it could equal zero, but it can't be less than that. So that's the last set of constraints there. Both of those have to be greater than or equal to zero. So to solve this, we need to graph all of our constraints. Let's graph that first line. 4x sub 1 plus 8x sub 2 less than or equal to 64. We're going to treat this like it's an equal sign and plot the boundary for that region. When x1, x sub 1 is equal to 0, that part of the equation goes away, right? So we're left with 8 times x sub 2 less than or equal to 64. So x sub 2 is less than or equal to 8. But on the boundary, right, x2 is going to be equal to 8. So when x1 is 0, x2 is 8. And so that is the point I plot on the y-axis, on the vertical axis. When x sub 2 is equal to 0, and when I plug that in, I find that x1 is going to be equal to 16 on the boundary. So I can plot that point at 16 comma 0. That's on the x-axis. That's on the horizontal axis. So that's the boundary. Now I need that to be less than 64. So that is going to be the space beneath that line. Next, I plot the line 5 times x1 plus 5 times x2 less than or equal to 50. And again, I can plug in 0. I plug in 0 for x1, and I find out that x2 is 10. So I have a point at 0, 10. And then I can do the same thing. Let x2 equal to 0. I have a point at 10, 0. So those are my two points where it crosses the axis, and I draw a line between those two points. And it's less than 50, so it's going to be anything to the left and below that line. And my next line, using very similar steps, I'm going to put in a 0 for x1, compute where it would cross the y-axis, the vertical axis, put in a 0 for x2, and see where it crosses the horizontal axis, the x-axis. And I have a line there for that. Less than or equal to means it's going to be to the left and below that line. We need x1 to be less than or equal to 7. So that's a vertical line at 7. I need x2 to be less than or equal to 7. So that's a horizontal line at 7. I need both of those to be greater than or equal to 0. So I'm just talking about things in that quadrant. And then I'm going to shade that area where all of those constraints are met, and I have that gray area. Now, my graph isn't exactly perfect. It's not really quite uh, my vertical lines and horizontal lines aren't exactly straight, but it's, it's close, and it will help us see what's going on. So step five, I plot the objective function. Now we know that the function is z equals 9x1 plus 12x2, but we don't know what z equals. So we just pick some things. I started with 36 because that's the greatest common denominator for 9 and 12. So that seemed like an easy thing to do. So if I set it equal to 36 and I plug in zeros for x1 and x2, I get the points 0, 3 and 4, 0. And so I've drawn that line on red, in red. And then I need another profit just to see what's happening. So I doubled 36 up to 72, and I got the points 0, 06 and 80. And I can keep increasing the profit 
to see where the maximum is. And I want maximum profit. So I want the point that's the farthest away from zero, from the origin. But now it's a little bit hard to tell from the graph. Is that going to be at C or is that going to be at D? One thing that we can do is move the line on out. And so if we keep moving that line, it looks like the one farthest away from the origin is going to hit at point C. But we can check this. Again, maybe my lines aren't exactly perfect. It's so always good to go back and check. We can solve for all these points. We can figure out where these lines intersect. And we can plug these into our objective function in for z and for profit. And we can actually see where is the profit the greatest. And when I do that here, right, there's a star there by c. That is my optimal point. That is where I get the greatest profit. Now, some of these points are pretty easy to see where they are. A happens when x1 is 0, x2 is 7, b maybe a little bit harder to tell. You can kind of tell by the graph. x1 is 2, x2 is 7. But look at point d, right? How do we know that that point is at 5.71 and 4.29? Where did that come from? Well, to get the intersection of two lines, we need to solve the simultaneous equations. For example, for point D, because that's the tricky one, we look at the lines that cross there, and we're going to solve both equations for the two variables. So the lines that cross there are 5x sub 1 plus 5x2 equal 50, and 15x1 plus 8x2 equal to 120. I can solve this by substitution. I solve the first equation for x1, and then I substitute that in for x1, the 10 minus x2, substitute that in for x1, and I can solve for x2. And then I can go back and solve for x1. And I get these two values for x1 and x2. I can also solve by addition or subtraction. So if I want to solve by addition, I'm going to multiply that first formula by negative 3 so that I have negative 15 times x1 at the beginning of that equation, and it will cancel with my second equation when I add them together. So when I do that and I add them together, right, I get a value for x2, and then I can go back to my first equation and solve for x1, and I get the same answer. So just a little reminder of how we solve simultaneous equations. Let's summarize. Linear programming is a very useful tool for a range of situations. If this seems discouraging, to have a useful tool that is eh, maybe not so much fun, it is a bit tedious. And we are limited to only two variables because we can only draw in two dimensions. So in the next chapter, we're going to learn how to do linear programming problems in Excel. But it's really good practice to learn to do these by hand so that when you get an answer in Excel, you can see if that answer seems reasonable or not.